We're talking today with Roger Talmadge of Roanoke, Virginia, and the interviewer is James Smither of the Grand Valley State University Veterans History Project. Okay, start us off with a little bit of background on yourself, and to begin with, uh, where and when were you born? Uh, I'm, I'm Roger Stewart Talmadge. I'm one of um, three sons of my dear mother and father. I was born in Glen Ridge, uh, New Jersey on the 16th of October, 1937. And then did you grow up in New Jersey, or did you move around? Well, uh, I, was, I, was, uh, I was raised by Mary Wilson, and I found out uh, years later that she was a woman of color. I never knew the difference. Anyway, she loved my brother and myself, and, and I grew up to about four and a half years. And then, of course, the war had started, mm -hmm. and my father was, uh, uh, was transferred. He, he was a salesman, uh, and he sold materials for make, making uniforms. So he was, uh, at, when I was about four, four and a half, we moved to Dallas, Texas, and we lived there a year. And then after a year, about 43 or early 44, we moved to St. Louis, Missouri, where I, where I grew up uh, until I joined the military. Okay. Uh, and how much schooling did you get initially? I, I, when, when I first got in the Navy, uh, on the 23rd of October 1954, I had uh, ten, uh, 10 years. And then I went to, uh, I got into Navy Reserve and became an aviation electronic technician. And, and when I went to boot camp, uh, it, was a it, was a, it was a special training unit because what, in the Korean War, when the Navy hit the beach uh, on that invasion of North uh, Vietnam, the LSTs were, were sunk by artillery. And so the Blue Jackets, Navy personnel, would dismount the, the ship and, and pick up an M1 Garand that nobody was using on the beach, beachhead where the Marines had landed, and uh, try to engage, the, you know, join in the battle. And the, and the gunny would say, oh, okay, over the hill, and, and the big guy would stand up and get hit, sh hit and, and of course they had to haul him away. So I, I, in my na Navy boot camp, I learned Marine infantry tactics and other kinds of things that Marines do. Okay. When you were telling that story, you were referencing invasion of North Vietnam. Did you mean North Korea at that point? No, North Korea. Thank you. Okay. North Vietnam. All right. So let's back Korea. up a little bit. Uh, so you basically you went through 10th grade, uh, and then you enlisted in the Navy? Okay. Uh, and what motivated that? Well, my brother got in, and he, 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 was, uh, he was a college graduate uh, from... Uh, uh, I guess MIT or some place like that, and uh, so he was uh, flying uh, some kind of a circuit. He, he, he called it a weather, weather, weatherology kinds of things from the United States uh, across to the Azores and back again mm -hmm. on a regular on a regular tour. And I found out later on he was also uh, they were hunting submarines. <laughs> My brother, two years older than me, also got in the Navy. But he got in both. That was active duty, and my brother Larry got in the Navy also. Mm -hmm. And uh, but he got out immediately because they found out he was he had epilepsy, and so he got out. So I got in the Navy Reserve, trying to see what I could do and still finish my high school uh, training. Okay. Uh, now, when you enlist in the Naval Reserve, and this is now this is. 1954. So you were 17 years old at that time. I was my 16th birthday. It was a week after my 16th birthday that I joined the Navy Reserve. Okay. I think you had told me you were born. Let's see, in 37, and this is 54. That'd be 17 years, I guess. I don't think they would take you at 16, but they would take you at 17. That's that's a good point. Yeah, that's the math. That's also the math. But okay, it, it's uh, also an error. My parents had to sign me in because I was 16. Okay. Uh, they would have to sign you in if you were 17, too. But. They, they would, too, but they, I was 16. Okay. All right. Um, all right. So, anyway, so you've gone and you've joined in, and so once you've signed up, now what do they do with you? Where do you get your initial training, your basic training? I went up to Wold Chamberlain uh, Naval Air Station up there in Minneapolis, and I, and I got my basic training. Uh, my boot camp training there, and then I returned back to my, uh, it, it, it was an attack fighter squadron uh, at uh, Naval Air Station Lambert Airfield, and uh, stayed there until the, f until I guess it was 
June, June of 56, 1956, and I went back up to Wall Chamberlain and got my electronics training. I also had a 60-man drill team uh, that uh, we, we took to, uh, around the state of uh, uh, Minnesota uh, for a display or, or whatever, uh, whatever they wanted for when they wanted a military unit. And the only reason I did that is because of my Marine, Marine uh, drill, drill training, uh, drill master training. Okay. Uh, so, um, and that was what you had gotten at the original boot camp when you were started training? Yeah, I, I learned that in the original boot camp when I came back. They, they recognized me from my former time, and so they, the 60-man the team there, I promised them um, <clears throat> uh, girls and, and drinks. <laughs> and, and every place we went, they met girls and had drinks. There they were. All right. Uh, just to, to clarify, you go in the Naval Reserve, so does that mean that you're, is that the weekend warrior thing initially? It's a weekend warrior. I went to training uh, once a month uh, at Naval Air Station in Lambert Airfield, right. and then then once a year, two weeks out of the year, I would, I would live there and, and continue the training, and I worked on, <clears throat> on um, F-9F uh, attack fighters, aircraft, they folded up their wings at night, and I also worked on P2V Neptunes, which was a hunter-killer uh, uh, multi-engine tur turbojet okay. aircraft. Now, were you being given specialized training for that? Yeah, absolutely. I, as an electronics, I was a, I was a certified uh, electronics um, technician. I worked on uh, navigational equipment. Okay. And did they give you that training in St. Louis, or did they send you other places for that? I, I, got, I, I got the initial, the basic training in Will Chamberlain. Right. And then, and then, then the experience where I had to practice it in, in Lambert Airfield. Okay, so you've got some of the technical training up in Minnesota too, along with the that, drill training and, and right. the rest of it. Okay, all right. Uh, now, then, how long do you stay then with uh, in St. Louis? Well, I, I stayed with the N Navy uh, Reserve, and also I got involved with uh, recruiting. I went to the Armed Forces Recruiting Station, whatever they called them in those days. And, and so I, I could get in high schools where they couldn't, because mm -hmm. I was a high schooler. And so I got in all the high schools in, 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 in the Webster Groves area, which is a, one of the suburbs of St. Louis, mm -hmm. and, and, uh, and, and beyond, uh, surrounding that area. And so I, I, I could, I, I could uh, when they have some kind of event, I, I could hand out pamphlets from the Army, the Marine Corps, the Navy, the, and, and, and Air, Air Force. Thank you. You're welcome. Oh, catch a bite, and go grab That's fine. So and and uh, so so that's how I got to know the army recruiter, and the army recruiter said, uh, you know, we read your scores when you get in the navy at, uh, when you join on the 23rd of mm -hmm. October '54. You, you got high scores on that. Why don't you take our little test and see what you think? So when it came out, they said we we can send you directly to Officer Candidate School right now. And I thought to myself, I don't know anything. Mm -hmm. You got to know something. To, you know, I, I, I had made a petty officer, which was moving up into the, uh, that kind of uh, environment. Uh, but I, I just had to be honest with them. So I, they said, Well, how about how about um, how about uh, some other job? And I didn't I didn't know anything about infantry or any of that stuff. But they said, how about the intelligence service? So I, I did a little bit of homework on it. I said, I'll, I'll sign up for that. I didn't know what I signed up for. <laughs> but they did ship me to Germany. I went to basic training. And when I went to basic training for the Army, it was in the engineer school uh, in, 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 uh, in Missouri. And uh, uh, again, the first, when you get there, you have a couple of days and you get sort of organized and, and then they know that they've count the number of people and they put you in, they assign it to a, a rifle or a rifle company in some training battalion and, and, you, and you go through about three, three months of training. Well, when we, after a weekend, we, we showed up on a Monday morning at our training site and, and they, uh, they put us in formation and they pulled six of us out of the formation. 
and they had us line up next to each other, and we're looking at each other and said, oh boy, we're in trouble. Maybe, maybe they're going to put us on a truck and take us away from off the post. And what they said, the, the, the sergeant said, uh, <clears throat> gentlemen, these, these, six, these, these six men are your leaders. You might not know that, but I, there's the one difference between you and them. Anybody want to know why? Somebody raise a hand. No, sir. No, no, no. Then you call me sergeant. I can see my face in their boots. Mm -hmm. so I never a Marine taught me that. Mm -hmm. So my boots were spit shine like the rest of the guys. And I, I was one of the uh, squad leaders in, 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 in a rifle uh, platoon. There's about three platoons there. But also, I have a knack for mimicking folks. In other words, I, I, I can. And that, that really helped me in that learning foreign languages later. What I did, my, my platoon training sergeant, he was a sergeant, I guess, sergeant first class, and <clears throat> he was a boxer. He, he, he could have been professional for all I know, but he wasn't. But he was a boxer and he represented the United States Army in some really interesting things in boxing. And he, and he got hit right here and he messed up his box, his, his voice box. Mm -hmm. And so he had to t take a breath and he, he'd tell us what to, to do. And, 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 and so, I, I, so I got mimicking that. And my, my commanding officer was, was born and raised in New Jersey. And he came behind a formation with a, with, a, with a platoon sergeant and he said, what do we do, court martial him or shoot him? So I, I just ran into the formation, pretend like I didn't move. <laughs> but I had I had him. This the only that platoon was standing tall, and everybody else was at, you know goosing each other and messing around. But I got after him. But anyway, that was kind of fun to. I, I didn't realize that, that that would come in handy later on. When we left the cantonment area, they pulled me outside the company, and that's 120 men, and they ha had me uh, uh, sing uh, Marine, uh, you know, and cadence songs. But some of them were inappropriate for the, the containment area, <laughs> so we did that. All right. And this is Fort Leonard Wood that you were at. Fort Leonard Wood. Yeah. Okay. Because you mentioned Missouri, but that's just for record here. I want to make sure we, we had that on there because that's where the engineer school is. Okay. Uh, and then how about how long did that basic training go on? Uh, three months. Okay. All right. And then once they finished that, did they give you intelligence training, or what happens next? Oh yes, yes. I left. I left that place. I, I think it was June of. Um, it must have been June of '57, and and, and I, 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 I progressed to Fort Holabird, which is located just outside of uh, Baltimore. And uh, so I was there another three months, and what they did, they covered the major. Uh, military occupational specialties uh, uh, for th that you would have as enlisted man. Uh, it's just a, just a sort of an in <coughs> sort of an introduction. Mm -hmm. So I went through that, and um, and then they said, okay, you're going to be an order of battle specialist. I went through there and and and. When I was talking to the sergeant, trying to figure out what what could I do in so those fields, I didn't want to get hung up in technology because that, that's limiting. <clears throat> so I said, "Well, our managers are offer, are order of battle specialists. They organize, they look at things and they organize things, <clears throat> and all these skill sets come to work in those areas depending on how it's organized." So I signed up for that. And he promised me, he said, well, when you get to your next assignment, you go to your senior intelligence officer and have him give you a brief of the, of the area that he's concerned about. You know, I'd probably get assigned to something, and, and the, the senior officer could uh, give me that briefing. So I said, well, is that a promise? He said, absolutely. He didn't know any, I don't know, I didn't know that, that he was, right, one of those things. So <clears throat> I, 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 was, I got aboard a ship. And went across the Atlantic Ocean on the ship, and and uh, they dropped me off in Hamburg, and that was in June, the end of June, 1957, and I was transported there to um, Oberursel, which is just uh, about 11 kilometers outside of uh, Frankfurt on Main. Okay, uh, and 
once you get there, now what happens to you, or how are you received? Well, I, w I was processed in, and, and they, they noted my, my specialty, uh, and <coughs> I, they gave me some, uh, some, some, some equipment, not much, because uh, when I was assigned to a, a unit, I, I would get whatever, whatever field things that you need. So I was getting oriented, so I, I go downtown, and I didn't, I didn't speak any German. So I, I just go downtown and, and go to the restaurants, and, and I, I, I didn't know what I was getting. I just ordered food, and some of it liked, I liked, and some I had no idea what I was eating. <laughs> but that didn't last for very long. And then, then they did sign me to the 7th United States Army uh, with the 525th MI Battalion. And when I got in with them, that was further uh, orientation, and I went downtown with whoever the GIs were there, and and and, and trying to expose myself to the, the Germany, and uh, so that lasted for a couple of months, and eventually <clears throat> I finally got. It was I, I was assigned to the 207th, the 207th MI detachment. I, I was an error before, and there I got all my front line stuff. You know that whenever you have to maneuver. You have, you have front line stuff you have to wear. I, I got my I got my weapon. I didn't know what it was. I guess it was an M14. I, I used it, <coughs> qualified with the M1. It could hit a target 11, uh, 11 uh, 100 yards away. But that, that's just once in a lifetime thing. <laughs> you don't do you ever, never do that again. But uh, but they did, did train us at Leavenworth to do the I mean at Leonard Wood. Mm -hmm. So then <clears throat> I got to know some. Ger I, I lived in a, a German uh, safe house, and what it is it's it, it's a it's a known facility, but it's just away from everything, and um, it, it used to be the servant quarters to some German who was. Uh, Wealthy, wealthy landowner or something, and the house was a mansion, but we were in this small uh, guest, uh, the guest, whatever you call it, uh, uh, workers that cooked and mm -hmm. took care of the whatever property. To me, that was a mansion. It was lovely. We had German uh, ladies that would that cook for us, and that's where I learned different kinds of foods, and and um, we we had we our only vehicles were. Were, were army jeeps. We didn't have any civilian, any anything, all military. And and uh, so there, uh, I, I went on along the Czech West German border. And my first encounter w was probably July or August. I was on the Czech border, and two German um, border police came up to me. And they said, "Yo, you come come with me." And so they, 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 they were saying, I guess, come with me or mm -hmm. something. I don't know. But they, 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 these guys were kind of bigger than me. I was going with them anywhere. And so they got me behind a big tree, and then they said, now, Shalmal. And, and, I, and they pointed toward a, a, a tower. And there's, there's three towers. There's one right in front of me and two here. And they had a 14.7 uh, millimeter anti-aircraft gun that they were watching me. They were tracking me. And they told me this in German. I translated that in English. You know, I was in trouble. I didn't know what they said, but they mm -hmm. said I, I should, I should not move this way, but move this way and away. And I did do that. But I was within, I was within a hundred yards of their, their the border, mm -hmm. and so they wanted to get me away. Okay. Now, why were you there? What had you been sent to do? Well, when I, I was, I was being oriented on my job. My job is. It's an organized thing, but you have to be familiar with what, what you're dealing with. And there I was able to, and I, I, I can draw it out to you, I remember it still, the layout of the several, there's five walls of barbed wire, and it goes way high, and then they have some fields that have landmines, and then they have other kinds of things, that, and then they have the towers and the lights and all that other stuff, and one tower can see two towers, the old Roman mm -hmm. way of uh, defense. And so they had the, the place well, well uh, covered. They also had some gates once in a while, and they'd come across and, 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 and 
and laugh at us and go back during the winter months when I was skiing and they'd close the gates up. But I, I wasn't there for that. But at least I was introduced to, to what it looked like all the way from, from West Germany, every, all the, the complete border from West Germany. And our section uh, was sort of the southern portion of it where we had, our, we had people monitoring uh, what, what is going there uh, all you know, around the clock. Yeah. And then my headquarters was back here and those little offices were all along the German uh, villages. But I, what I did when I was in, in my detachment house, <clears throat> um, I'd go out with the German citizens, and, the, and, and, and the, the, these fellows were sons of, of some wealthy people, like a great big furniture clearing house. They built furniture, beautiful stuff, and then they put it in a retail environment. Mm -hmm. But they take me downtown with me to and this was in Stuttgart, and uh, in, in April 1944, the British and the American bomber, bombers had leveled the city, except for the old city. We always kept the old city so we could so we could reorient ourselves when they, when, when they flew in there. Mm -hmm. And uh, so, um, and that was a transportation uh, north, south, east, west uh, crossing. So they just tore out, and bombed all that stuff away. When I got there in June and well, July or whenever it was, August, uh, they had already demonstrated something and they, and they killed some of our, our, our GIs, put their heads in the fountain. So when I went downtown with these guys and, and I go into the Altstadt and, and go into cities, uh, um, restaurants or, or places where you get drinks, and it, the people from the opera house used to come in and, and perform. I, mean, I really heard some wonderful music, and I was used to that from home. Mm -hmm. And so now I got to see it and hear it. And so I, I was really thrilled with that. But they, they told these guys that I was deaf and dumb. So I said nothing. But I learned a lot of language, a lot of, and I'd ask them about it later. And, and we got, we, the police called us one night. We were, we were, we were driving along in, in um, that general area. I guess it was Nuremberg this time. We were driving in the, in the general area, and 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 uh, I started making the sound of the of the, the German police when they're after you, the doodas sound, and it sounded realistic. And police car comes up alongside us and find him 50, 50 marks. <laughs> he thought it was funny. I didn't think it was funny. It scared the willies out of me. Mm -hmm. But anyway, so I picked up a lot of words. In the meantime, um, I, I worked on some crypto stuff. I had I had one of the the old, it was, a, it was a German cipher system, and so they had me work on that and do a little administration here, and odds and ends, and they also had me uh, be the clerk, the company clerk, and, 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 and you have to type everything first time correctly, and I, I made a lot of mistakes and a lot of papers I was throwing over my shoulder. Anyway, one time when I was there, a Lieutenant Colonel Moratti shows up, and he's the commanding officer of the 525th MI Battalion, and he was out of Stuttgart, and I was in Nuremberg, so I got it mixed up when I was talking about that other earlier about Stuttgart. Uh, but anyway, he asked me, is there any needs I have? Yeah, Nuremberg. Mm -hmm. And I asked him, well, yeah, I, I really, this job here is, I'm really having a hard time with it, but I'm trying my very best, sir, very best. I do have a need. Uh, one of my one of my recruiters promised me that I should go to the senior intelligence officer in my local command and get a brief on wh what he's what he's confronted by, and that way I could organize for my detachment commander. I could organize this great big wall ma map uh, to to reflect what he's what he's facing, and then change it because we got reports every day, and and very seldom did it change anything. Uh, on the other side, but once in a while they, they, they caught something moving, mm -hmm. and that, 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 that I'd interpret what that meant. If they went this way, sideways, that was one thing, but if they're coming towards you, that's different. So uh, the colonel laughed. He said, Okay, um, I'll get back to you on that one. So about three, three weeks or four weeks, or I don't know, I, I forgot about it. I, I, my detachment commander, who was a major, called me in the office and he said, Sir, uh, 
I was a private. He said, um, <clears throat> young man, uh, Colonel Marathi has set you up uh, with a briefing with a senior uh, intelligence officer for the command. It just so happens to be the G2 of the 7th United States Army in Stuttgart. You, you, you take a train there and stay overnight and get briefed by him, take a train, come back and tell me what he, what he tells you. Oh man, so I, I made sure my uniform, I wore the, the old Ike jacket and all that stuff, made sure it was, I had a tailor made, so I looked pretty pretty sharp, I didn't weigh anything, so it didn't matter. So I went in, went in, went, got settled into my little barracks, and, and then the next morning I went over there at nine and reported in to the secretary, and, and so uh, the secretary, uh, or the, whatever, the sergeant there, took me in the office and sat me down in the briefing room. And the briefing room could hold about 30 people, and I was the only guy in there. And he sat me right in the middle of the front, and here's this huge board with, a, with this map on it and, um, uh, of, 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 of Germany. And uh, so I just sat there, and this tall guy comes in. He's a full colonel. And he said, son, I've come to brief you. Your, your sergeant said that you, you're going to get a I'm going to give you that briefing. And I don't know what to do. He says, now you just sit right here. And so he, he started at one end and went to the other end, and he, he explained to me that if you have something that's, uh, that's armored, it's painted yellow. If it's, if, if it's uh, tanks, it's uh, something else. If it's um, engineers, it's something else. Infantry, you can get several ty types of it, and it's blue. And if it's airborne, it's got one symbol. If it's mechanized, it's got another symbol. If it's just foot soldiers, it's another symbol. And they have certain, each one is different strength and, and, and so forth. And depending on what's happening, they'll, they'll get in, 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 in uh, combinations of groups, task force. So they'll have a, a lot of stuff. They'll even have artillery. And it's, some of it's ar uh, mobile, you know, it's mobile ar artillery. And so he went all through that stuff, and that's red. All right, so any questions? So I asked a bunch of questions. And I made notes. I mean, I was making notes. I was making. I had my notebook, and I was going, and, and, and all this stuff. My mind was trying to figure out, figure out how to make, how to take what he did and, and duplicate that for the major, Major Brown, in the detachment. So I got finished with that, and he said, "Well, son, uh, I, I want you to know something." I said, "What's that, sir?" The lowest rank I've ever briefed. This briefing is a two-star major general. I hope you enjoyed it. And if you have any questions, son, you call me. So I left. I saluted and left. Mm -hmm. So it took me a while, but I got in, the, and, and his office had a, had one of these jail gates in it, you know, it's steel bars, mm -hmm. and his, his map was classified because of the, it, 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 it would confirm to some outsider that we knew more than we, what they knew that mm -hmm. we knew. Right. <laughs> so. I looked at that monster and I said, well, sir, I, I'm going to need some time in here. Fine. So what I did is I color-coded the whole night. Everything, everything was black and white. I color-coded the whole thing. And you could tell where, where the armored was located. And if they move, that's very sensitive stuff. If the artillery moves behind them, that's really big stuff. I mean, not only does that call, cause interest in our battalion, which is... In, 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 intelligence, but also for our, 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 uh, our division, our corps, and our 7th United States Army. Mm -hmm. And I wanted him to know the first, whatever I could figure it out. So anyway, we, we color coded all that, and he could look at it and could see where that stuff was. And when it moved, he was able to move, do, do things to it, and, 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 and they could see when something was happening. So when the Berlin Wall came up on the 13th of August, 1963, 50,000 tanks moved closer to the border. So that was kind of neat. I was, I was in Italy at the time. I had to come back quickly for that. But anyway... Um, I think that would have been 61. What, was it 61? Berlin Wall, yeah. 61. Yeah, Cuban Missile Crisis is No, 62. you're right, 61. Yeah. 13, 61. You're right. I'm glad you... Historian, you know. No, that, 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 good. <laughs> that, see, I still was there. I, right. I, I stayed there. I was there in country until '62, so not '63. Okay, so that's when the wall went uh, went up, and uh, so that that was significant. And to 
putting up the wall, they, they moved themselves to, sh it was a show of force, and that's one of the things I, I had to learn, what some of these formations mean. I didn't know that part, but I knew that it meant, it, it, it's a show of danger. Mm -hmm. That's all I could, uh, I could, I could figure out. So, you know, just pause here for a moment. Now, so you've kind of laid out for us what it meant to be an order of battle specialist. You're identifying where all the enemy forces are and keeping track of them and, and so forth. And so you've done that by creating the map and this kind of thing. Uh, what other kinds of jobs did you have while you were in Germany? You did that okay. part? Okay, so that part, I, I was very diligent with, with that. and I, I spent a lot of time downtown uh, on the weekends. <clears throat> I, I bought the commanding officer's old 1949 Ford and, 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 and did whatever to it to not spruce it up, to, but to make sure it was running right. Mm -hmm. And then I would I'd look at the little money I had. I didn't have a lot of money. I was, I was still a private. They, they lost my prior service records or didn't whatever, and I, that money came in later. And uh, But anyway, so I'd look at the little money I had, uh, and, and the exchange rate to the German marks was good then very fine, so I, I would figure out what that meant, and then I'd go out, uh, I'd go north for a while and stop and go to some village, and I'd go to the, the local Stube, which is a, a restaurant, and I'd look for a bunch of old guys and I'd sit down with them. And uh, I'd, I'd tell them, ich bin Amerikaner und ich will Deutschland, and that's all, that's all I told them. Mm -hmm. So I'm an American, and I want to learn German. And uh, so they tell me this. They tell me some off-the-wall stories, and I wouldn't get but part of it. And and uh, but they were laughing and having a good time, and, and they enjoyed it. a young young man that wants to be, have a heart for Germany. Mm -hmm. It goes back to this this guy with a with a throat thing. Figure out where he lives. I didn't know that I was doing that, but I was doing that. And so I, then I go east, and I go south, and different places and I still went to, with these guys that I got in trouble with and the Germans come over in Nuremberg so I continue that I work with this uh, crypto thing and uh, whenever it failed I, I figured some kind of algorithm I didn't know it was an algorithm but I figured some mathematical way to fix it I'd be deep into a message de 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 deciphering it and the thing would I don't know what I made a hiccup or maybe I burped or something and so I figured a way to catch back up where it messed up and, and then go from there. I mean, that was a sequential thing, but, but nonetheless. And I, I, I was able to do that quickly because the machine was a quick machine would catch up. So I did that for a while, and, 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 and then at some point, um, the detachment commander called two of us. There was a guy that had a really intelligent fellow, and he came, he came from North Carolina, and uh, his name was Bill. And, and so Bill and I were called in the office to the detachment commander, Major Brown. He said, they're looking for 80 men to, to get, get some special training. And we'd like you to uh, apply for it, we'll support you. And uh, you might not get it, but you know, there's a lot of people going to be applying for it. They're, they're going after people in Europe because they're already here. They have some kind of a, a and also they, they want to know If you're teachable, and I didn't know, they were. He was looking for something specific, and he couldn't tell me. Mm -hmm. Teachable, okay. So here's this little attachment, detachment. So he and I put in our stuff, and he has a nice resume. Did well in college. Did all the right kinds of things. Met all the right kind of people. Uh, his um, his uncle was the commanding general of Seventh U.S. Corps. So he's a. I mean, he was a. Lieutenant General. I even went down to see him. He, <laughs> that's for the heck of it. So anyway, uh, so all right. So we put this stuff in, and I must 150, 200 people put their names in it, and the 80 were selected. And Bill and I were, we were both PFCs at the time. We got promoted, mm -hmm. and so they, 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 we went down there, and these other guys were sergeants, lieutenants, and captains, and it stopped at captains. There's a reason for that. And um, all right, so we got down there, and then they selected the language. I don't know what Bill got, but I got Polish. 
and that is a real blessing. Remember, I was the most uneducated one of the bunch, and I needed every everything that would help me. Polish is the only Slavic language that's written in Latin letters. Mm -hmm. I didn't know that, but it really helped. And as the letters are laid out, that's exactly how you pronounce it. So that was that was so pronouncing was 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 also good. And I had a couple of really good, good teachers that pushed us hard, and 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 such like that. So I, I learned Polish, and I got, I think I got a, a B plus or something something in that course. And I had to do a couple of things. Uh, and, and that was reading, writing, and also to be able to use my skills in interrogations. You may have to do that too. Now, <clears throat> I was the youngest guy in the class, and there's a lieutenant, at least a couple of the lieutenants, that thought I had, uh, you know, I was a problem because I was different than anybody else. I wasn't quite strack, as you call it. And uh, refined is the other word, and so they, they get after me for, for for all kinds of silly things. I also had a, a, a terrible allergy, and so bright lights like this, I have to wear sunglasses in, in my classroom, and they, they they little things like that really really upset them. But nonetheless, got got through that course and 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 and, and did fine and, and survived them, and then then we took a maybe a couple days break. And then switch, you go into German. So the people that were taking Slavic language the first time, the first half of the course, six months, would take German. The others that they switched the others around. So the, so the Slavic language folks had always a new bunch every six months. So we got into class, and two of our classes were set aside. And they walked in the classroom. And I had, I, I had 12 or 13 or 14 other fellows in there, and uh, this other class had the same thing. And uh, I don't know what else happened, or, or maybe less, maybe we had 10 in those. It was a small class. And so uh, I thought, oh, well. Hmm. So he came up and he said, well, I'm, I'm Mr. Walters. Uh, I got in the service in uh, whatever it was, 19... Or something like that. And he learned English. He could, he could speak all kinds of dialect, whether you're in Ch Chicago, St. Louis, New York, uh, California. It doesn't matter. And he, he demonstrated that for us a little bit. And I was, uh, design I was supposed to uh, land on the shores of New Jersey in 1944, <clears throat> but then we had some visitors that showed up in Normandy, and so I was changed to that. So I was fighting the American and British and anybody else forces on their borders. And of course, I was in Germany for a long time. He was the, we only had one German fighting us because everybody else was fighting the Russians. That's what, I, that's what they told me. <laughs> everybody I met said, oh, I was fighting the Russians. I was on the, Aust on the Eastern Front. Oh, well. Hmm. So he was the, and so what he would do, he'd, he'd listen to the battalions as they're talking, or the companies on the radio, and he'd mimic them. Oh, I could relate to that. And then he sent bales of hay to the artillery units and the artillery ammunition to a transportation unit. <laughs> and, then, and then the war de ended. And I don't know where they picked him up, but they, they hired him to be our teacher. And, so, and then he went on to say, so weiterhin werden wir nur Deutsch unterhalten und ihr könnt etwas Deutsch, so wir werden kein Englisch mehr reden. So basically he shut, he shut us off and we didn't speak English in the class ever again. But he took advantage of that to take us out on the town to different things to introduce us to. Instead of me going there and saying, ich mag essen, I'd like to eat. And sometimes it was good, and sometimes it was bad. I learned the good stuff was schnitzel, and the other stuff you don't eat because it's something else. <laughs> mm -hmm. so, but but he, he helped us with that. And, um, and uh, let's see, nothing in particular. Did he do German dialect at all, or different parts of Germany? Well, what happened, what, what, what really helped me is uh, I, I speak a, a, a kind of a German it's not the Hochdeutsch, I can do that, but basically it would, it would speak in Dusseldorf. 
when I was able to pick up Schwäbisch, and it's a, it's, a, it's, it's a difficult language, it's close to Stuttgart, and I used to go to the, to, to the uh, restaurants, and I, I, I could pick up their dialect, I just mm -hmm. sensed it. Mm -hmm. And then I go to Bavaria, and they speak completely different. Bavaria is completely different. And uh, for instance, you're walking down the street, and they say, Chris Gott, which means, Greek God, you know, and you do this. And they said, no, but it's just a, hi, hello. And, uh, and, and, but nobody else says that. And, and they had these little colloquialisms, and I had a whole book of them that I had learned. The fact is, I didn't, I, I got so good at it, I couldn't even translate it. I just used it. And, and so that was kind of, kind of interesting. But, um, no, the German, uh, it, it came along, it came along well, and I had at least four or five dialects I could use. Now, if I were ever used, I was told that, by a captain, that uh, if, if something happens, in other words, we, have, we go to war, you're going to be assigned to the Pripyat Marshes. And the Pripyat Marshes is the marshes of five, five rivers. Do you know where that's located? Yeah, but it, that's a good ways east of where you were. Well, the thing is, that's where the, that's where the, that's where the, That's where the irregular forces would gather. Mm -hmm. In World War II, yeah, the partisans against the Germans were That's there. That's correct. And, and they, 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 that connectivity was still there. And so what they would do with us, they'd drop us off some evening. And then we had all our communications that we could use to bring in uh, supplies or whatever else, or, or, or whatever, anything that we could pick up intelligence-wise would help the effort to inter, inter interdict the long lines of supply coming from Russia into the east, mm -hmm. I mean into the west. And, and uh, I was told, and the Russian tactics were, that w once they run out of something, they, they, they forage for it, fuel and basic mm -hmm. things. They couldn't get parts for their vehicles, but they could certainly get other things. So uh, we, we were to interrupt uh, that as, as much as we could. Uh, there, was no, there was no pickup plan, though. It was a one-way ticket. Mm -hmm. and that was it. Uh, didn't have any German. Um, I didn't have any English. Uh, anything with me. On I have no, no markings whatsoever. And that was the other reason that for all, all of us. Have, no, no tattoos that, that they could relate to anything. And uh, so my my second story and last story was I was a German citizen in a foreign country. But the captain told me that. I said, How do I get? How do you get there? We're over Amagau now, mm -hmm. you know, in, in Bavaria. Mm -hmm. How in the world do I, do I get there? You know, the road's probably going to be blocked. The trains are going to be blocked. You can't, you can't go by train. There's no boats I know you can get into Poland. So I said, well, we're going to drop you off airborne. I said, but I'm not airborne qualified, Captain. He said, son, I understand, but you will be when you land. <laughs> and, and that was my introduced. That's the only time I heard of it. Now, supposedly that assignment continued for a number of years afterwards, and then it, it dissipated because of the equipment that we now have, we can pick up all that movement activity or whatever else and, and, and try to interdict it way before it becomes a threat. So that, I stayed that way, and then, then I moved, uh, after my training uh, at Oberammergau, I, I went back to the 513th MI group, and I worked in the debriefing interrogation section, and people would come across uh, in the borders, any of them, from East Germany to, to West, uh, Hungary or, or Czechoslovakia primarily, and I, I, could, I, could, I could slur my, my Polish and, and, and talk to the ones from Czechoslovakia. It was close. Mm -hmm. I couldn't write it. And so I, 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 I developed reports, and that was turned into Bundesnachrichtendienst. That was the, that's right. The, German intelligence service, and what they'd run is background checks, and then the ones that were kind of an interest, they would uh, come pick up, and, I, and that, that, that was at our facility. Uh, the other ones were filtered out to where they were uh, integrated into the German society to get them jobs mm -hmm. and, and places to sleep or you know whatever, um, and, and, and become German citizens. On one occasion. Once in a while, I'd fly out of Wiesbaden, and I'd fly into Berlin, into uh, into uh, uh, I 
forget the name of the airfield. It's Temple Hall? Yes, thank you. And we, we'd fly by those buildings. They flew, over, they flew over those same buildings were carrying coal in 49, mm -hmm. 48, 40, 50, and so forth for Temple Hof. And uh, I picked up uh, some people and then flew back in a turboprop, uh, U.S. Air Force uh, uh, bird, got him into and debriefed him and found out he was a major general in the East German Air Force. He was the uh, assistant chief of staff for them. And he got out by himself by coming through Berlin, mm -hmm. came by the S-Bahn. And so uh, and we noted all of that because we needed to know how to go the other way. So um, so they, the Germans were really interested in him. And so we turned him over to them. And it took about six weeks and we got his family out with the children, with no losses, out of Potsdam. And they haven't figured it out today how it happened. That was before the wall came up. So, all right, so about five or six months passed, and I, got, I really got to know this guy. You know, it might help my German a little bit. Mm -hmm. I picked up a little bit how, what he, what they, how they operate in East Germany. And so anyway, um, I, 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 was, I don't know where I was. Uh, I was at some kind of a social gathering and da dance or something for, with, with the unit, and two military policemen came in, and, come up to me and said, we have a visitor at the gate, and he wants to speak to Roger, and you're the only Roger we know. Mm -hmm. Okay, so fine. So I, I excused myself and went out to the gate, and here's this guy. And they, and they said, oh, you know him? I guess I know him. He, he was driving a, a tractor for an 18-wheel 18, 18 vehicle, but he left his trailer downtown, wherever that was, in, over Ursula. Mm -hmm. And uh, so we, I got him on post, and we, we sat down, had coffee, and and visited, and he told me, I can't tell you, but I got a new name. Uh, I, I can, you, you can guess where I am. Uh, he was in the Dusseldorf area. He had a new name. He was a truck driver. His family up there, they're all in school and, and, and doing well. Of course, they speak the language, that's mm -hmm. not a problem. And, and he said, I, I, I used to be in charge in the East German Air Force of all this, mm -hmm. and now I just drive a 18-wheel truck any, anywhere they want me to drive it. I get paid a whole lot more, and I'm free. Mm -hmm. So he just wanted to thank me. Isn't that neat? Wow. Yeah, yeah. that's neat. That's pretty impressive. That's, that's neat. So then from there, I left that assignment, and I worked for, I still was associated with the 513th, uh, but I can't go into any detail about it. It, it, it was a, it was a, it, it was a forerunner to it, it, it was an offshoot of the OSS, and so we, I got in the human intelligence side of the house, and uh, I got involved with, with connectivity with just about anybody in Europe, including the F side, but, um, uh, and I, I stayed in that position from 1960 to 62, and it was during that time one of my supervisors got a hold of me and said, you know, I was going to school at night. I had already gotten a half a, I got two years of half, half a mm -hmm. degree, <laughs> associate degree uh, from the University of Maryland. And, and uh, so he, he said, you ought to go to Officer Christian, uh, I mean Officer Christian, uh, Officer Canada School. And uh, so, but you, you, have to, you have to go through, uh, they have to talk to you and discuss things and, mm -hmm. and, and, and and vet you and, and just check you out and, and before they even recommend you for that kind of thing. So why don't you, for, to get practice and being interviewed and, and that kind of thing, why don't you go through this effort? So I signed up to become a direct commission. And I did, I went through that stuff and I, they were told me to read, read the newspaper, read particularly the sports section and know the players by name and find some way to make them laugh. Well, and I was, I was just a brand new sergeant. What did I, I didn't know anything. I was about 25 years old at that time. And uh, so I, I started the process. And I got through one, one board, and that turned out nicely. And I did all those things. So I really studied. I was, in, I was encouraged, and I kept doing kept reading more and looking at things, uh, trying to find out what I was slow on on the first round and, and, and dig more, get more of that stuff. 
uh, tell some maybe some personal experience that, that were um, hilarious and, and, and possibly shouldn't be mentioned, meaning it wasn't classified as was compromising. Mm -hmm. So they liked that. And uh, so I continued on. And then I got to a point where this, okay, now we got to, you seem to be a good candidate. So we're going to start, we're going to put you through uh, the physical stuff. We make, we can check you out physically and whatever else that we need to do. So I went through that. And, and the only thing I got hung up on was uh, my allergies. They were, they were, they were, they were so, uh, I used a word uh, that, that says they're all the time. And, and this, a doctor from Heidelberg wrote a note back. He said, does he want a direct commission or not? Really? Tell him to write seasonal hay fever. And I did. And, and that actually, when I, when I started taking, they told me how to take care of myself, mm -hmm. it became seasonal hay fever. I just would not take care of myself. So anyway, I, I got that direct commission in June of 1962, and then uh, so I, I was transferred out of this assignment I had in downtown, mm -hmm. downtown um, uh, Frankfurt. It's not, Frankfurt is close, mm -hmm. and, and Old yeah. Ursler, like I say, 11 right. kilometers apart. And, and while I was in there, my my uh, my. It was my first wife and myself. We created a touring. No, it wasn't. No, we didn't. It wasn't then. That comes later. Uh, but anyway, uh, I, I left that assignment, and I came back to the original place that I came in in June of '57, and they made me a deputy executive officer, and they're getting ready for inspector general. Now you know, and I know that I've been through a lot of stuff, on, on how to get ready for inspections and how to look like something. And, and, and of course, the, your room has to be right, and, 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 and everything in your locker has an orderly, and it's a certain place, and all that. So I went in and tore the place up, and, and got everybody mad at me. And the captain was West Point, and I don't know what in the world, I, I don't know what his executive officer was. He he didn't know what to, he did not know what to think of that, and, and I told him, sir, if you're not blunt. They're not going to do anything. They'll flunk. I, if I were the inspector general, I'd have given you an F. That's what I would have done. And that's what I would have done. Anyway, so he, he okay, he, 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 all right, he listened to that. And uh, I, I thought a West Point officer was a little bit different than that. But I found out you have West Point officers and other officers. And the other officers usually know how to relate to you. But the West Point officers are a little distant. And, and in some cases, rightfully so. They need to be. They're officers, but anyway, they need to communicate too. But anyway, so then we had an inspection one time, and the outfit was out there. And he wanted me to walk behind him, in next to him, but behind him, and inspect the troops. And then he would he would critique me and the first sergeant on, on what they might want to do. And by, quite frankly, they looked really sharp, except this little guy about this tall, about four foot or, or so tall, was walking next to me, dressed in a captain's uniform. So we got finished with all of that, and I, I was just, I was just, I was just, I, 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 was, I was really upset, but I was really moved by that, and I just had to really bite my tongue. So we got in the building, and I chewed him out. As a West Point officer, you, you just insulted everybody out there, and, and you're not kidding anybody. You don't dress your child up as, a, as an officer where they have, you salute the uniform, not the person. Mm -hmm. And if you think they're saluting you because you're a West Point officer, there's something wrong with us. And I hope I didn't uh, upset you. So, oh, no, no, that's fine. <laughs> Well, anyway, they, they look sharp. They really look sharp. The only thing, that, so don't show up in a formation with him dressed like that ever again. He's your son. Let him follow you in other ways. Mm -hmm. So then the other thing I, I did, which is kind of unique, before I left that command in 62, September, I walked into the non-commissioned officers club with my hat on. Do you know what that, that means? You buy the drinks. So I put $200 on the counter. I said, Yesterday it was Roger. Today it's Sir. Drink, drinks are on me. When I walk out of here, I'm Lieutenant Talmadge, and blow it out your butt otherwise. And so <laughs> and, and that, and that's how we took. They grew up with me. These mm -hmm. guys were teaching me stuff or or, or getting mad at me because that's whatever, and, and it's normal things. And and uh, so that, that that's how I ended that that tour of duty. I came back to the United States, and then into Fort Hood.
into the 203rd MRI detachment. Okay. Uh, just to back up a little bit, I mean, you mentioned sort of your human intelligence assignment was one you can't say a whole lot about. Um, did, you, did that involve actually going into Eastern Europe, or did you stay within West Germany and our side? I stayed on the west side and didn't cross over. Mm -hmm. um, I had plans to, if, if I did, it was under wartime conditions. Okay. The only time uh, I was compromised in 1960, one of my Polish instructors, a lady, had me over for supper. And she captured, oh, she has answered me a lot, asked a lot of questions. She must have had a tape recorder mm -hmm. somewhere. But they got my photograph, they got everything. And, and so uh, I, I changed jobs right after that. I mean, when, when I came in to, to, to over Amiga, I, I, was, I, was, I, was, I, was, I was nowhere. Mm -hmm. And then when I worked in, in downtown uh, Frankfurt, uh, I was also nowhere. And, and whatever I did was uh, went one time, but I never did it again. In fact, as I was working an operation, and I wasn't trained in, in, in this human stuff, but I understood that you never did something twice. And I caught, a, I caught about 20 of our folks who were, I, I was doing the sergeant majors ad administration, all these master sergeants and all that stuff that were trained and really glib in their languages. Uh, they were out there making contacts and, and, and monitoring the guys that did kind of go over there, but we didn't go over there. Mm -hmm. Bottom line is, they were using some of the same cars, the same apartments or other buildings that other people were. And I built a network, I compromised the whole thing, so I turned it in. Mm -hmm. They shut that operation down. They were on us. They were on us. They could tell where we were. So I, some places I closed out, which I was a newbie. I was given a, I was given a 32 caliber pistol with, with a, five rounds in it. One chamber had to be empty for safety purposes. I went to one place and cleaned the place out. And I left, and I was wearing a, 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 a kind of a sports suit, sporty jacket, mm -hmm. tie and all that stuff. And these five guys, these well-developed older gentlemen were outside waiting for me. And I came by and they just, and, and I kept going. Another time, so I thought that was close. Another time, I, I borrowed one of the cars that we got from um, some agency here in the United States, and uh, it was a, a Saab, an S A A B, mm -hmm. and it has a shifter system. I, I could drive any any foreign built mm -hmm. European car, but I hadn't driven this. And I, I drove it out of the motor pool and I had a hard time gearing, gearing down and then I, and I, I came to a stop sign and rolled through it and I was trying to get it in gear and these two horsemen rolled up, came up next to me, knocked on the window, I rolled the window down. And, and they said, you drove through the, in German, they, they, no, in English, they, they told me, you, 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 you drove through that Halterstelle, that stop sign. And I said, I'm having trouble with this car, I haven't driven it before. And, 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 German, and then, and then, so I got it in gear, and I said, and I jammed it, in, in, in whatever first gear I could get it in, and I said as I drove away, he says, "You're just going to use whatever ten marks or whatever this fine is to go buy coffee," and I roared out of the place. <laughs> now he could have written my, they could, they could, they, they, they were laughing. They could have written my 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 uh, license plate down. It, it was easy to, to find me. Mm -hmm. it, it was really nothing. If that was the easy one, but anyway. So that, that, that was sort of wound down that. All right. Well, this, uh, so now we've made it in, into 62, and now you complete that assignment, and now you're going to move uh, on to your next assignment at Fort Hood, Texas. Fort Hood. Okay. All right. Well, this tape is about up, so we are going to stop here and give you a bit of a break. To when I okay. went to Hood. Okay. So we've gotten to the point in your story. You've now gone back to the States. You go to Fort Hood, Texas. Uh, what are you doing there? I'm a, I'm a second lieutenant, and this is my first official assignment as a, a su 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 second lieutenant of the military intelligence. Um, they, they didn't have a branch insignia, but they were going to have one, so I, I wore engineer brass. That was a cover. But it, it, 
didn't mean anything. And then they put me in charge. Uh, I was a det detachment commander, and I had command status of a prisoner of war, interrogation prisoner, yeah, inter interrogation prisoner of war detachment. Mm -hmm. And my detachment was unique. They had detachments on the East Coast that are geared towards Europe, that part of the world, Africa, and on the on, on, uh, and, and Texas uh, against Asia. Well, mine, I, I, I had one of my Russian speakers with me that I served with. He's a master sergeant. Mm -hmm. so it's really neat. So I have him as my number two man. He's a really excellent gentleman, just a fine, just a fine gentleman, a wonderful family. Now, when I was in Germany, I did get married, <clears throat> and from that marriage, we had uh, three children. So they, 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 they were born, at, two of them were born in Europe and one was born in uh, Fort Hood. But in the uh, 203rd MI detachment, <clears throat> we had a regular uh, housekeeping training, the things that you do, and then, then we would also gear up for uh, field exercises. And I, I participated in two rather complex field exercises that took place in South, North and South Carolina. And uh, we would, um, uh, one time we went there and, and the aggressor forces was the 5th Mechanized Division. The second time we went there, it was, uh, I guess, elements of the 101st Airborne and some other mechanized division. Mm -hmm. I, I forget who it was. <clears throat> so we had to prepare for that, and uh, so that's that's where we pulled our pulled out our bag of tricks. Now these folks I, I was with, every one of them was either reserve officer, maybe regular army, uh, uh, but I don't think I had West Pointers in that. And uh, so when my commander was uh, Lieutenant Colonel Rose, a very fine a gentleman, thought through things, things very well. And so he wanted to, to, to do things correctly. The, 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 the stuffy people were at Corps headquarters. Now the G2, which is the intelligence officer for Third, third United States uh, Corps, uh, uh, he's kind of stuffed shirt. And, and so, I remember I had my, my, you know what my background is, so when I passed him, I'd salute him, give him a nice highball, and he wouldn't return a salute, so I turned him in. Now, I was probably one of the only officers he returned a salute. <laughs> I could care less. I'm not there to make friends. And I, I didn't realize that that's probably my downfall. <laughs> but anyway, um, so getting ready for things. So we were a STRAC unit which means if bad things happen, the uh, 18th Airborne Corps uh, over here in North Carolina and the 3rd Corps in Fort Hood, Texas would gear up and get ready for it. And of course, mm -hmm. that comes up. I was in, in the Fort Hood unit when things kind of got messy in the Cuban crisis. Right. But in the meantime, we went to this training. And so what we did, uh, is uh, I went out there and, and, and we maneuvered. We landed in Columbus, South Carolina. We were the red forces. We were the bad guys. And I, I didn't pay attention to a whole lot of stuff, uh, but I do know that some people in South Carolina didn't like the bad guys. So they, 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 they sprayed our equipment with, with graffiti and all kinds of odds and ends. You know, pigs go home, you know, that kind of stuff. I don't know. They did that. Mm -hmm. they, they did, and of course the blue forces were the, were the good guys, and and, and they, they went out there with, with with coffee and donuts, and we didn't get any coffee and donuts. <laughs> but I befriended, I befriended, one guy came down to bring us coffee and donuts. We we we'd go down the river, and 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 and, 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 and maybe take a take a shower down there because we had a shower unit, and so he would he would bring. Uh, little treats that somebody baked and things like that. And he was a very nice gentleman. And he was a comptroller for the Kershaw County. And and so he got to know us and I don't know, I can't remember his background military wise, but gosh, he was a Marine, that's what. Mm -hmm. And so he said, is there anything I can do for you? 
Sure. Yeah, I, I love coming down here and visiting with you fellas, and I appreciate what you're doing. This is a war game, and I understand you have to do the best you can, and, and some, of the, some of our local folks have taken advantage of that and so on, and he was trying to ask forgiveness for that mm -hmm. on the Anyway, so he, introduced, he took me one evening to the meeting of the Kershaw County Marines, or, or Marines of Kershaw County, mm -hmm. Post I, right. I, something like a Marine Corps League or something like that. Yeah, yeah Marine Corps League, and and uh, so we, we chatted for a while, and he said, "Yeah, what, 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 Lieutenant, what, what, what can we do for you?" And uh, and and so um, I, I, I said, "I think we, we, we need some help." I'm and sorry to interrupt. Your wife left this on the table. So what we did, didn't know exactly the rules, uh, 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 but we were supporting this, uh, this operation with, with what we had from, from uh, Fort Hood. We, we had some, I, I forget the forces we had, but nonetheless, we, um, we had, with permission of the, uh, Lieutenant Colonel Rose, we had about five guys grow beards. And then we sent them to the Carolinas two months before we got there. And all they did was just uh, get to know people. And these, were, these, these guys were seasoned soldiers. Mm -hmm. They knew what they were doing. They, they, they had some infantry background and that kind of stuff, airborne. And uh, bottom line is uh, uh, got to know some very key people in South Carolina and parts, only certain parts of North Carolina. And, um, and, and there's a reason for that. So w we showed up and we really didn't talk to them. Nobody ever saw us stick together. I was in my little unit and I was in my little uh, um, MI group uh, unit and, and we, we did our work and we, we housekeeping things and, and, and whatever. I, I, I go out and, and I interrogate Sometimes we capture somebody, and, and we interrogate him. So we had that kind of thing going on. Uh, there's a unit that came into some place where we we're close to us, and and uh, so I, draw, I had my jeep. I had a Pepe Shaw, which is a 1941 Soviet machine gun. I had one of those with me, and so I captured uh, a deuce and a half, and, and all the equipment on board. And, and two soldiers and found out where the commander was. And he was down, down the road a piece uh, in a restaurant with his uh, 20 or 30 soldiers. Captured all of them and he was mad. He was really, he said, don't point that thing at me. And so we, we wrote that all up and, and, and turned that in. Sorry. All right, so you. And, and turn that turn that information in, and and, and we did that for uh, whatever uh, a while it was. But that was good training for our our guys. And what happened with it, with uh, one of the things I found out. So this is really I needed to know this later on. Um, <clears throat> there was an area, and you could mask it. It was large, a large area, and for some reason, from two o'clock on Thursday morning till maybe the next day at 2 o'clock in the morning, that, that large field was going to, all the electricity was going to be turned off, already been coordinated with the neighborhood. And there was no lines in that area, but there was electricity in that area. But the, the, the open fields, I mean, for, for, for farming. So we surrounded it with a bunch of tanks. Next day, here comes some brigade, and they parachute in there with a general, and we captured the general, and he pulled rank on us, and we said, "Sir, I wasn't, I wasn't with, the, I wasn't with the capturing party, but sir, uh, all due respect, get in this, get in this, AMG. <laughs> and so we hauled him into the place and brought him to General Dunn, who was a three-star general in the Third Corps, and he said, "I'm, I'm sorry, uh, General, but you are my prisoner." <laughs> And, and so that was one of those, I didn't realize, I, I knew they needed to make contact, but I didn't know what it was. In the meantime, these folks from the Kershaw, the, the, the Marine 
Corps League from Kearsaw County made me an honorary member. Mm -hmm. And they, they take their, their vehicles out and then and they come back and report uh, uh, order of battle. He, they, they'd read the number. They knew how to read the numbers on the jeeps and the mm -hmm. tanks and the, whatever they had, and and, and so they, they would report where they're located. And I just reported that up directly as much as I could. <laughs> and, and so we said they sent bombing raids over them to get their supply points, or or, or we, we readjusted ourselves because there a whole bunch of people over here look like they're going to do something mean soon. Mm -hmm. So we'd uh, either beef, beef it up or, or, or lean it lean. And, and, and so we did that. And, and uh, on one occasion, when we are uh, doing this, the second time we returned, we got worse. We, we really did some bad things. So, so we did uh, had the same intelligence uh, activities and su such like that. But on the second round, we, we got really um, them engaged in a lot of, they almost drained um, uh, the, 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 the military base at, Fayetteville, North Carolina, of all the troops, and they were down where we were, and so we sent a, a contingent of about 15 guys, and they captured the flag off the city hall of Fayetteville and brought it bound down to us. <laughs> and the three-star general of the 18th Airborne Corps was livid, and so then we had a formation, and and whatever it was, the the judge, the uh, what, what is that? The um, yeah, the empires Empire, around yeah. it keep things safe, so they don't do something stupid. But also the, the different tactics, and so uh, at that time, this is our, our units were the first and second armor division. This is armor against armor, mm -hmm. so it's a little bit different. But nonetheless, um, uh, they, they they said that we won the second round, the second time we were out. So that means our protocol says the commanding general of the unit or his representative will bring the sword out to the commanding general of the other unit. So General Dunn showed up with his staff, and and somebody showed up, <laughs> but the three-star general didn't show up from, from Fort Bragg, and and uh, so we, we we got the uh, we got the uh, we got that sort of saber, and of course you know General Dunn had a little party over that, so that was kind of nice, and he was a very personable I I individual. <laughs> and, now, uh, you had mentioned earlier the guys who went and grew the beards. Did the guys who grew the beards. Yeah, they. they, what, they, they what did they, they give they you were, information, or do you have no idea what they did? Oh, exactly. We ran those operations in Europe. We dress people up and do something, and they go do it, and then come back and report it, and never be seen again. In other words, they go somewhere else. Okay. But they were new there, and so so we, if we dressed up in some mode, we had the the, the accoutrements to, to confirm that. So they they came in town. And introduced themselves, and got to know people, and and uh, they, they were maybe inspectors of um, uh, farmland mm -hmm. or some agriculture or something off the wall, and and they had enough information on it to be believable, mm -hmm. and so they just looked like everybody else, and they they spoke their their their, their lingo, to a, to a point, mm -hmm. it really wasn't that important for for, for what they were going to do, so uh, and and and. Um, but they wanted to keep up with current events. But they were, had sensitivities that I didn't know about. You, 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 shut, you shut an area off. I found out later when I, when I got in infantry, we, 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 we shut down an area and bring in 25 helicopters. And then you needed a certain area, mm -hmm. or, 20, or, or 10 at a time, whatever. And anyway, you're going to drop a pretty big unit in the area. That, that unit was that could be a, a battalion 500 mm -hmm. or, or a brigade of 2,000 and they dropped it they dropped, dropped the brigade in there okay so they were doing kind of advanced scouting for you essentially that's oh, oh, uh, well uh, uh, advanced penetrate what you call infiltration mm -hmm. of the local community for intelligence purposes okay. all right uh, so now um, so you have the field exercises periodically uh, now what Played out when, when the Cuban Missile Crisis happened. How did that affect things for your base or your unit? Right. Uh, what we did is we, we went on alert, and I, I stayed in the I stayed at Fort Hood, and we, we briefed. We had briefings uh, in the Pentagon. Not we weren't involved, but we took all of our lieutenants, and all of us had to become <clears throat> glib in some something, 
quickly, and then and then we give almost the same kind of information. But what we were, we were doing, we, we'd interpret the photo interpretations of all the vessels on the high seas that were coming from Russia, and then we we'd run our our. U-2 pilots over over Cuba more than once a day, and and we compare what's going on. You can see what's very time sensitive, mm -hmm. <clears throat> and they, they would be marked up quickly, and and then that, that that transposed to our our organization. So I had general officers come to Fort Hood, and other general officers go to the Pentagon. So the East went there, and the West came to us, and so we brief a forward division. Uh, Commanding generals and and, 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 that, and that kind of stuff, mm -hmm. and also some of the some of the upline higher level uh, of their general officers, and uh, some of these guys had been in World War II and all that kind of stuff, and they they, they could really they could seed between us, <laughs> so uh, we didn't make many mistakes. They'd catch them and, and, and make sure they what we were saying the right kind of things, so we briefed them all during that time. In the meantime. I don't know if America knew this or not, maybe they did, but uh, we stationed both of our armored divisions in a tactical uh, posture in Texas. We also stationed, and I wasn't aware, I, I didn't get on the ground on this one, we also had several air wings uh, postured the same way. That's, that's, that's just in Texas. Mm -hmm. And then we had our two airborne <clears throat> divisions in Florida and the communications between the two. Mm -hmm. And um, we, 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 we knew that President Kennedy was getting some advice. And we were hoping we weren't going to go to war, but we knew what, 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 would, what, what we needed to do, and so we'd do it. We had also, um, I, I didn't know that, but I, I learned later, that a lot of Cubans had been come here, and, and they were trained to do things, <clears throat> and the partisans in country that were friendly to keeping it a free country uh, were also available to come to the to the war, the, the beach or whatever mm -hmm. you want to call that whole the battle of pigs, uh, whatever it's called uh, area. Mm -hmm. So that, that that was all set up, and uh, and when the and the, when when they attacked, and, 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 and the president canceled our operation, so we, we st stood down. We were, we still in, I was still in, physically in Fort Hood, mm -hmm. and, and the folks in Florida uh, stood down. And so the Cubans that went in got, got wiped out, pretty much. They had no air cover, because we c canceled all of that. Cause we we could have really put them in a back, back brace. And um, so... I don't know what that saved. Did that save World War III? I'm not sure. But I do know that the Soviet ships turned around and went back. Mm -hmm. um, we had such a, a fine relationship with Cuba. That was not a problem. But, but when the Russians got in there, they, they, they turned it into a, a problem for us. So that's, that's something we, uh, we're very sensitive about even today. Mm -hmm. so. All right. Uh, but basically, when a lot of this was going down, your unit was involved in a lot of the relevant intelligence work and preparations for what the military response would be if we had one. And, 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 and we kept organized what, what, what the fleets were doing and what they're doing on the ground, because mm -hmm. they had a missile capability that could have reached the United States. Uh, at least that's what we were told. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, so we'd watch. watch and, and what they do, they move the stuff that could hit us out, and then it put them in their shelters, so we're watching it every day while they're doing all that stuff. Mm -hmm. So we kept structuring, changing it. The threat level now is X, it's now going back to Y. And so we, in the Pentagon and, and us, we did the same thing. And pr basically all of our sea, air, and ground forces were all informed, because we had a lot of stuff at sea at the same time, as you know. Okay. But during that time, during that time, I put in our uh, because I was being coached by Lieutenant Colonel uh, Rose and also his upline to uh, put in a uh, request to become a regular Army officer so I wouldn't be reserved, so I'd be mm -hmm. rifted. And so I went up for interviews, and I lived at 209 Dunn, Dunn Street in, in Colleen, Texas. 
And so when I, I was, I was, I was briefed by the one star or whatever he had to say, and then I, then I had audience with Lieutenant General Dunn, and he laughed. He says, "You live on, you live on my street." And he was <laughs> laughing at me and all that stuff. And when he had one of his parties, he'd have a party every year. He made it a point. He and his wife. His wife was Miss Straightforward. Uh, she, she was wearing. Here's the commanding general, a, a third corps, armored, biggest unit in town, and, and and he's running around, and his wife's wearing a a, a cotton dress that's uh, got flowers on it, very down to earth, and he hunted me down. He embarrassed everybody around me. He said, "I want to meet you because you're one of my commanders." He went down. He didn't care who you were. You commanded it. You know, uh, the chicken coop. He went down to see the chicken coop commander. So he, he was very personable, mm -hmm. very personable. So he, I don't know what he did, but it was strong enough to get me into um, orders to move in November 1963 from Fort Hood to uh, uh, Fort uh, Benning, uh, Georgia, in, to get get my mm -hmm. infantry training. Right now. Had you made that move when Kennedy was assassinated, or did that come while you were still in Texas? I was on the road on the 23rd of November, 1963. Uh, I, I drove just south of Dallas, Texas, uh, and I forget what highway I was on. I think it was 10, and I was heading east. I pulled into a gas station, and this is terrible. I, I, it's in my, burned in my mind. I pulled into a gas station to tank up. I was driving a Volkswagen bus with my family, wife and three children. And uh, somebody said, somebody shot and, and killed the president, or somebody shot the president. I said, well, it couldn't happen to a nicer guy. I said, that's a stupid thing for somebody to say. Why would they want to say a nasty thing about our president? He's our leader. He's a commander in chief. And I got in the car. I was furious. And I drove to the motel, and it was on there. I, I just, my heart just went, ah. So when I arrived in Fort Hood, uh, we, we, we lived, we were someplace, a hotel or whatever. Everything was shut down for a number of days, as you know. And when you arrived at Fort Benning? Yeah, I, I, I drove okay. right, right to Columbus and I got in mm -hmm. uh, someplace. The Army put me in yeah. some, some kind of a hotel situation until I found a place I could rent downtown. And, and uh, but everything shut down. Everything was shut down. and. Uh, so we went through that whole process of grieving, and uh, my wife is German. She didn't understand a lot of that, but she knew that that was tr problematic. She just didn't understand. Mm -hmm. And my kids, they were too young to understand anything. So that was, that was, how dare them? How dare anybody to do that? And that turned out to be, so I, I did some research on that sometime later, and, but that, I, I don't know how you'd prevent that kind of thing. And that's why I'm concerned about what we've got now. We've got to keep our president as we did him in prayer every day. All right. Uh, now, eventually, you get into Fort Benning and you can start picking up what you're supposed to be doing. So, what's the assignment there? Okay, I was as a I was a first lieutenant because I had enough time and grade to make first lieutenant, <clears throat> and I, I moved into the uh, first battalion, uh, airborne, one eighty eighth. Infantry Regiment winged attack, <clears throat> and, and the 11th Air Assault uh, Division, which was a training division, mm -hmm. it was a training in air mobile concepts. The generals of the World War II were trying to figure out how can we move people and keep them organized, and still have the ability uh, and flexibility to move them quickly. There, there's no, historically speaking, there is no successful airborne operation of any size. Small units, but not they always get scattered all over the place. That's why they had these clickers in, mm -hmm. on, on Normandy. So they wanted to eliminate that problem. So what they did, they, they formed this, they took the 11th Airborne Division, called it back on active duty, because they'd come out of Europe, and made it air assault. And, but everybody, the generals were all, all airborne operators. They knew the, the things there. But they want they experimented with helicopters, and then they kept getting them smaller and smaller, and uh, where we could fly everybody in helicopters, and we could either jump out of them on the ground, jump out of them in parachutes, or in some of them you could hover and, and you come down in a ladder, all kinds of ways of doing it. And and so I got into there, and I was the executive officer for uh, 
uh, B Company, 1st Battalion, 188th Infantry Regiment. And that, that, that was, they were physically in Harmony Church within the Fort Benning complex. Mm -hmm. So I started there, and, I, and then I went through the, the orientation. Uh, I had to go through um, uh, Officer Infantry School first. Now I'd been there <laughs> as an enlisted man at, at uh, you know, when I was in Missouri mm -hmm. at Fort Leonard Wood. So this is essentially the same thing, only it had some different kinds of, it had some twi twists and changes. And, they, and they, I remember one situation that I thought I blew. You know, I had to make decisions on stuff, on, on crossing uh, um, areas that were uh, what they call danger areas, only they had a little water there. So you, if, you, if you made the wrong decision, you fall in the water. And uh, they, so they changed us around real quick and moved us around. When, when, in that, and if you made a wrong decision, they said, "Well, you just got shot in the head, Harry or Lieutenant or whatever they call them, call us. Uh, you're in charge now." And I, I had one that I couldn't figure out what to do. I usually had a team concept, and and but I get it done, and so the poor guy fell in the water. So my briefing was when I got with a sergeant and, and or whoever it was that was evaluating what I was doing. I I, I just raked him over the call with coals. I raked him out of the coals. I was not prepared, and I, I don't care uh, to uh, admit that. I, I think that's important to know. Uh, this was uh, new. I, I've been in play, da 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 da, and I had assignments before that are a lot more dangerous than this. And and if if, if they fell in the water, they, they were dead, they were killed or hurt or something. And so I, I just smoked him. Uh, maybe that maybe I got a point on that because I got <laughs> through that course, and I went back to the company. And I found out all the officers were either West Point or, or uh, officer candidate, and, you know, mm -hmm. cum laude. And here's this triple brain, is a direct commission Mustang, and I don't know anything, and I still don't have a college education. Mm -hmm. And now I'm in B Company. Well, the, the B Company commander there was very straight, and uh, he was rigid straight, and hard to, hard to do anything with. Uh, but he, he was consistent on certain things you need to do, so I, I focused on those. As an administrator, I tried to take a lot of the administrative harassment off his back. He had a drunk that, that would make PFC and get busted the next month because mm -hmm. he got, went out and got drunk. So I fixed that problem. Nobody talked to anybody where they lived. Well, why do you do this and what's going on? And They, they didn't get into that. And what, can, what do you have to offer? This guy was a baker, and he used to get up at 2 in the morning, and he would bake his stuff that the military police in, in the cantonment area would drive out to test it for us before we got there at 6.30 after our five-mile run. And so we made military police were our friends mm -hmm. in B Company mess hall. So what we did to fix him, we'd pay him we'd pay every payday. He'd show up. We take all his money away. We drive him downtown to a nice hotel. We pay his bill, and his food, and his alcohol, and leave. And Monday morning, we pick him up again, bring him out, wash him up, put him back in the dining facility, and he was there until the next payday. <laughs> and he made corporal, mm -hmm. and it stuck. But they didn't know they didn't know how to communicate with him. Mm -hmm. I thought that was far better than the way the straight way the straight way to handle him is just. Drum him out of the service, but he made friends. And later on, I'll tell you what happened in combat because of what he did. All right. Now, uh, do you start working and using go, using helicopters and things? This is part of what you're going to be doing once you're with a unit. Or yeah, even though I was executive officer, I had to I had to jump off a 34 foot tower. I had to jump out of a helicopter hovering 120 feet off the ground, 90 feet off the ground. If you're jumping off from 120 feet up, do you climb down something or just free no, fall? No, you're on, a, you're on two, for safety purposes, you're on two ropes. Okay. And it's a certain kind of a, a neoprene or whatever it is, it's, it's, it's a mixed, it's, mm -hmm. it's a, a mixed uh, material. I can't remember what it is, but it was very strong. It could hold 3,000 pounds, each mm -hmm. one. So we double, we double hooked them into the helicopter. We had four guys, 
or eight, depending on who, what's going on. And, and you, you get four out on the on, on the on the um, on the runners or uh, yeah, yeah yeah on the, the runners there or whatever yeah. But anyway, and then and, then, and sometimes you, you go and you go together because otherwise the helicopter would go crazy. And then then if there's more on there, then you hook you, you, you hook them up. But uh, but anyway, the idea was once you jump, maybe it was just four we did this. You had uh, um, one guy that was a that was a crew chief, and what he would do, we'd be hooked in there with these with these things that you use in uh, mountain climbing and all that stuff. He'd unhook that, mm -hmm. and and, uh, and and that would come down to us. So we so we'd have so we'd have to collect the rope and and take off. If we were in a combat situation. That was important because we didn't want the enemy to get the hold of that stuff because it's still good and we could use it for for any numbers. We could put trip people coming coming after us and or, or something else or get rid of it. So I, I had to go through that, and then later on we had these uh, helicopters. The Chinooks had uh, rotors at the front and the back, and, we, and we'd hover, and you come down on a, a ladder that's maybe 60 feet or, or so off the deck, and that means. You, we could, in, if we were in an area where that was, had a lot of foliage, you could get in the foliage that way and get through, mm -hmm. and then you'd, you'd drop the ladder because it would hook up the air, the, the helicopter, and, and, and mess it up. Uh, I, I, I was a safety officer on, on a training um, our, our our cab unit. We had a the ninth cab was in there, and and they they were fighters. They were like, like infantry that had all kinds of stuff that they could do. And, and, and they had, their, their helicopters were part of their program, part of their organization. Mm -hmm. So we, we, we tra I trained with them and, and helped them um, do well. Um, and and that, was, that was a real responsibility and, and, and a delight to do. We got to know the folks in Columbus. They got to love on us. And when, when, we, <clears throat> when we get back from some of our exercises, we, we went to Carolinas to do that too, and that's where my, my connection from my third third core days paid off because the Marines showed up right away and they said, "Okay, how can I help you?" Mm -hmm. So they they, they they try to help us, and we, we didn't win any battles. I tell you, we didn't win anything because mm -hmm. uh, because uh, that's when the Fifth Armor came in, uh, uh, Fifth Mechanized came yeah. in, and we couldn't defeat them. But the, the intelligence was helpful for us because at least we had an idea of what we were against. And what we did, we, we could hide and we, we could be someplace and they couldn't find us. And can you imagine a, a large infantry unit with, with helicopters mm -hmm. trying to hide? And what we'd do is we'd get our chemical unit out there and, it, and they'd build, a, they'd build a, uh, this, this ground, ground fog mm -hmm. and you couldn't find us. And they'd just sit there wouldn't go anywhere. <laughs> just sit there, and we just wouldn't move, wouldn't communicate, you know, radio silence. And uh, we did some of those, some of those, but we didn't get, we didn't get it, we didn't pull any stunts. Mm -hmm. we, we couldn't do any funny things. Um, when we got, so sometimes we'd get captured, and, and uh, so we'd be very careful with, because they, some of them got rough with us. They shouldn't, we're American soldiers. So I got after them on that too and uh, didn't make any friends, but I didn't get hurt, and that was good, but we couldn't have that. And, um, you know, that, that was it. That, that, those were straightforward. That was just strictly infantry stuff. Mm -hmm. And I did everything. I, I reported the wounded in action and all that stuff. I got that training while I was out uh, in, the, in the Carolinas, because we had, we had to re go through that, that process of what, what do you do? Mm -hmm. And so that, that, was, that was excellent. So then, um, then uh, our commanders changed. The West Pointer left, and another guy came in, and he was OCS, uh, Officer Cadet School uh, Officer, but he had been in Vietnam, very successful. His name was Livingston, and he trained us uh, combat action drills. So when when something would happen, it was it was scenario number one alpha or, or mm -hmm. whatever. It, it, we, we, we got that. We could get it down that like that. So it depends on if we were ambushed, we'd do something. If, if, if it were um, some kind of a passing thing and, and, and 
we, we, we were overpowered, we'd do something else, call in help. Um, if it was um, a long range for consciousness and finding something and, and hiding out and being still and let them run, run over us and then report their, what they're doing, uh, that kind of thing. So we went through all of that, and I had to do that too, right with them. I, I walked in the swamps in Fort Stewart with, with the mortar platoon, and uh, I wasn't good at it because I couldn't carry the big stuff, and I carried whatever I could. And, and sometimes I'd be with my own, uh, uh, the, the mortar platoon, you have, you, have your, you have your infantry platoons up here uh, m moving forward in front of you. And, Thank you, sorry to interrupt. Um, we had a reservation that and for the city. Well, I saw, I saw him come around the corner. Yeah. All right. Well, I think we're talking clearly for the most part, people can still hear this if we have a little background. Okay. Uh, we were talking about um, you, you've joined your battalion now um, with what is now the, the 11th, the Air, 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 Air Assault Division. 11th Air Assault Division. Right. Okay, uh, and you're kind of talking about you talked about some of the different things that you had done with them, um, and are there other pieces of that story at this stage as you're first kind of learning the ropes and working with these guys? But yeah, learning how to become an infantry officer. And when I was in the army, working in the intelligence service, sometimes I wore civilian clothes. I mostly wore uniform. Uh, but then again, it, it was more casual at, uh, in, in some cases. That we had some serious things where people got in, got hurt. Uh, some of them disappeared, that kind of thing. Uh, and, and of course, I, 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 don't know how, I don't have a whole lot of detail on it anyway. Mm -hmm. But here is a regiment, and, and they had rules and regulations they, they, they complied with. And here, wherever I was working on it, that, that, those didn't apply. You just did your job. So here I am in the infantry, and so I, I, I got in, there was 180 men in that Bravo company at that time, and, and uh, that's average, and, and so I had a, 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 a really tough, sharp uh, first sergeant, and I, I didn't know what to do with the, anything, and uh, but I, 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 I knew how to wear a uniform, so I got, I got that part right. So what, what, what the non-commissioned officers did by and by, they trained me how to become a, a, a good, strong leader as an infantry officer. And I needed to have the technical stuff done well. So that means I learned, I learned how to fire all, 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 the, all the, everything, all the weapons. I didn't, I, I, did, I did, I fired the mortar, you know, the tube. But all the weapons, you could take them apart, even in the dark. Every handgun, the rifle, and, 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 and such like that, machine gun, and, and so that, they taught me that. Then they taught me tactics, and and, and, and how to communicate that, those kinds of things. They also, uh, in Harmony Church, it's right next to the Ranger Department. The Ranger Department trains everybody in the United States Army uh, that wants to and qualifies the, 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 the Ranger. Uh, techniques of, of, of warfare, and that, that's the officer and enlisted personnel. So these guys were all ranger, airborne, um, jungle expert, uh, and, and been in airborne units a long time. Some of them been in airborne units a long time, although we were not airborne. The unit was airborne, but we were not at the time commissioned as, as a, to that function. And I, But anyway, I, Just like I mentioned to you before about having the shiny boots, or, or get, getting attention. Well, when we had when we had our annual, we had field inspections and they have maintenance protection uh, uh, inspections annually, and a company commander could rise well with superb reports. So I knew how to work those, mm -hmm. and so I, I got with the supply people, and my supply sergeant hoarded all the brand new stuff. Look how look look how wonderful my 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 supply room looks. And he was a senior non-commissioned officer and I respected him. But I said it's the worst one I've ever seen. And so within a week he had all the clean 
blankets that had been repaired, and all the, all the new stuff he had on his shelves were with the troops, mm -hmm. as it should be. If something breaks, you replace it. Okay, so we got that squared away, and, and all his books re reported all, everything I just said. We did that up front properly. Then <clears throat> took on the armory. The armory is a, is a place where you can lose your can in an inspection. And so what we did there is uh, everybody had to do what I did. You clean your weapon, you make it right, turn it into armory, armor, and I had two armors in there. And they were really sharp corporals. And they did the best job they could, and I gave them breaks and extra plaudits and you know, whatever benefits for the mess hall. And, and, and so they did a, an excellent job in keeping us squared away. And then one of the things I found out about security, you could break in that place without a whole lot of effort. So I put double grates. I, I also doubled the walls. The walls were built with an outside, but I built an internal inside. So you break the outside wall out, it's going to take a month of Sundays to get further beyond that point. So the walls themselves became fortresses. And the windows and, and, and doors, you have to, you need a settling torch to get through to the, to the armory. So we got that done. And I remember one time we had a field inspection, a maintenance, I'm sorry, a maintenance inspection coming up. And, and uh, so uh, I don't know who was thinking this through, but this was a brigade size, uh, well, we were a brigade size, a few battalions. So we were going to go out and do something, then another battalion was going to go out and, and so forth, rotating around, and, and so each one had their time. Our time landed when we had this maintenance, annual maintenance inspection coming. The other battalions didn't have that problem, but I, nobody could change that. And of course, I, I, was, I was not happy with that. So what we did, the sergeants, when I, when I came to my sergeant E6s, they were all squad leaders, they had 10 men that worked for, worked for them and they did things right and they were sharp. And so a couple of, about three or four of them got a hold of me and said, so we sat down and had coffee with nobody around us. It says, we're gonna take you down to the, to the ranger school department and uh, they have equipment and they also have uh, the, the instructors and you know, all that fun stuff. And, and what we're going to do is we're going to get a, a, a table of organizational and equipment issue of all our weapons. Okay. Now what we need you to do, Mr. XO, Executive Officer, we want you to appoint, and we'll give you the names, six men to be on vacation uh, out of town um, during these days that we're out in the field. And when we come back, actually, when, mostly when we come back, so they're, they're out of the field to start with, and they're, and they're, and they're still in, 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 the, in this area in our com compound. All right, so we went out to our exercise with those weapons, and they worked fine. And, 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 and so then when we came back, when the guys came back uh, in, into the containment area, now, these, these, these six guys were there, and they each collected by serial number every one of those weapons, machine guns, mortars, you name, whatever we had, and drove them down to the ranger department, and they spent six days cleaning them. The inspectors came by, and one, one of my corporals were, was there for the inspection, salute, and opened the place up, and they went through, and they... They couldn't get dust off anything because he, he spent the time it was climatized, climat climatized the, the facility for that event. And uh, we, we passed, they, 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 it was amazing. Everybody else was all messed up. There's a little bit of goo here and this, this stuck here, this didn't work over there and all that stuff. So they couldn't, they never did. I don't think they found out how we did that. They probably thought we were cheating. Mm -hmm. Yeah, right. So anyway, that, that's, that was the first lesson I got from them. And uh, so that, that was very helpful. Uh, uh, as far as when the annual ins part of that, I guess they went to the supply room and, and gave him high marks. Oh man, this is, this is the way all uh, supply rooms should look. It serves the company and the personnel. And yet, 
it's up to date, it's current, it's clean, it's orderly, orderly. all the books are, and, the, and, and, and the, your, your supplies are sharp looking. Puerto Rican, mm -hmm. he, was, he was great, but he was a hoarder, so we had to watch that. Then also, during the inspection, Inspector General's annual inspection, where they went through the barracks and all that stuff, we had two guys that, we, that had emergency leave, and they had to leave for two days with one of my deuce and a halves because they had no transportation. In that deuce and a half was all of our paraphernalia, mm -hmm. our junk, and whatever else that we shouldn't have. And they, they, they drove, I don't know where they went. I have no idea. <laughs> so we, 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 got, we got through there, and then everything was fine. The inspections were laid out fine. The floors were fine. There was no extra stuff, because usually you have a little something extra, and it doesn't fit in your locker. You just lay it against the wall. So all that was gone, including the, the headquarters where I was. So that, that, that worked out. And so we did that kind of stuff. And um, the other thing we did for morale, which the other companies never thought about, we used to go on 15 mile uh, marches, force march, and they'd have pretty much their combat gear with them. That, that's, that gets heavy after a while. And I had, I had a Volkswagen bus I told you about, I came back with from Germany. So what I used to do, I'd go to B Company and I'd get these, I'd get the, get these coffee urns with a hundred cups of coffee in it or whatever it had and then, then I had all these little uh, I had these bakery items that our baker made that, that morning uh, you know, I, I had lots of them so what we do is we go out there and I get in the head of a head of the, the they're, they're coming down the road like this so I'd, I'd get ahead of them and I'd, I'd stop and as they went as the troops went walk by we'd hand them a coffee and a, pa and a pastry, and then a coffee and a pastry, and then, and then when, when they got past us, we'd go in front of the line and pick all that trash up, and they'd leave, and then I had a, a truck behind them go up to the next formation and do the same thing until we got the company, got all 100 and whatever it was out there. So that, that was really, that, that was a morale builder. So the battalion said, boy, that, that, that's nice. Well, well, we got so, so we had to expand that to help the battalion do that too. <laughs> so we did that. So that was fun, and of course we made fun with the military police because they got very close to us because they'd sample our stuff uh, around after midnight, and and uh, so they helped us out when things got kind of stuck. Um, one of the problems I have, I'm a Talmadge, and one of the problems Talmadges are fine in general. Uh, but you have little groups that are in the south, little groups in the north, little groups in the west, and, they, and sometimes those little groups of Talmadges get in trouble, or they cause trouble. And one of the things that I had to fight was the, 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 the racial business, mm -hmm. the difference in Georgia between a black man and a, and a white man, mm -hmm. or such. And when we went on one of our maneuver, we took everybody, took, we didn't have this inspection waiting for us, but we went out and we had, had, to, had to get our formations and understand a quick response to, to, to different scenarios that we'd be exposed to and, 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 and hit hard and be evaluated on it and then maybe do it again and again until we get it down and then wait a while, a month or two, and do it again and see if we still remember what we remember. One of these times, we're getting ready, and we're going to be going, this is one of those Carolina things, we're going to go for maybe a month. And so one of my NCOs has this vehicle, and, and I noticed his headlight was out. And so I, I said, okay, I want two of you guys, because they're black guys. I, wanted, I want two, in case I, in case I needed a witness, and I, needed, I didn't know I needed a witness. Drove downtown, got a phone call. Sergeant Jones, Lieutenant. Uh, I'm in jail. Come get me. Okay, Jones, I'm on the way. So I went down there, and uh, sure enough, Jones and his buddy uh, were in jail because Jones's car's light was burned out. So I talked to the desk, desk sergeant. I said, Sergeant, I'm, I'm uh, uh, Lieutenant Thomas. I'm, I'm executive officer of the rifle company, and these two men work for me. I gave him a direct order to come down and get that car fixed. He said, You're, you're darn tootin', uh, Lieutenant, and we got him. And um, what do you want? I said, I want him out now. I said, you can't have him. I said, may I, may I have your phone, please? Just, just bring your phone over here and put it right here, because I'm going to call my Uncle Herman. Uncle Herman is the governor of, of Georgia. 
He's also a, a, a brigadier general in, in, in the Georgia National Guard, and he's my uncle. I'm his favorite nephew. Give me a song. He said, just a minute, please. Chief, Chief of Police came out and said, Sir, when would you like him out? So I walked out of the place with those sergeants, and I told them, you guys, you flatheads, what's wrong with you getting in trouble with those police like that? You, you should treat them with respect. After all, they're white people. And we got in their car and drove off laughing. <laughs> Well, that, that, that's, that shouldn't have never happened of course not. because those same guys were with me in combat mm -hmm. because shortly thereafter, shortly thereafter, there was an order that came out to us. We were in the field training locally and we had to come in from the field because uh, our, or, our division was, was going was to turn in their, their colors and we were going to be appointed as the uh, first cavalry. Air Mobile, mm -hmm. and and so Mother Dorsey came out and, and and accepted the flag and all that stuff and what she said and we hugged her and we thanked the Lord for her and all that whatever we did to her because she's the mother of the first cab, mm -hmm. and 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 so uh, we did that on 1 July 1965. So then we had to get ready for our combat assignment. We didn't know where we were going, and if they did, I I, I, can't, I, I, I don't know what it was. It was Vietnam. Mm -hmm. That's all I knew. So then they selected some, some folks to be the advanced party. Oh, advanced party. Hmm. wonder what they do. I don't know. Nobody ever trained me in that. So um, what they did, they took all the executive officers of anything, inclu including a, a one-star general. <laughs> and uh, they sent the one-star general and about 2,500 of us over there in August of... 1965, mm -hmm. and, and, and we, we, uh, we, we, flew, we flew out of Georgia, and we landed in San Francisco. I was able to say goodbye to my, my brother and my, my mother, who lived there. Uh, and and uh, then we continued on to Hawaii, to Guam, and then into Vietnam, and that's where the fifth, the third Marines were located there. Mm -hmm. Just, they're uh, located there, and we stayed there for a couple of days. So that might have been Da Nang? That, yes, thank you. I forgot that. So we, we were there for, we had no idea what was going on. We're still in our nice, clean, you know, iron mm -hmm. jungle fatigue. They weren't jungle fatigue, they were regular fatigue. Whatever dungarees or mm -hmm. not dungarees, but they were the old old uh, uh, they field. Are they greens or khakis they, or? They're greens, mm -hmm. khakis and greens, mm -hmm. but, but, but but greens. So and, and we had leather boots and all that stuff. So we finally flew uh, into Anke. It's a short strip. It was owned by a a, a rubber plantation owner and, and a wealthy man. The, the mansion was still there. We had the airfield that went ran in front of it, and we could that one one C-130 uh, could land on there very very nicely without going off the end of it, and uh, there was about six of us in, 60 of us in there for the whole time we left Georgia. We either sat, stood, or laid on the deck to, for to make up the time because it was, it was a very demanding flight. Mm -hmm. Nonetheless, uh, the, our executive officer uh, was a major promotable lieutenant colonel. Uh, he was a very kindly gentleman, uh, but, but, but tough. Mm -hmm. And uh, our, our commanding officer was a guy by the name of Ken Mortel. He was an aviator, a very accomplished soldier. Uh, I, I don't know if he was West Point or not, but he was one of the, one of the rising officers mm -hmm. in this process of air mobility. So he just, a sharp career, a lot of neat things. So he was our commanding officer. We really didn't get to know him until, because he came on board when we got anointed as the first cab. Mm -hmm. So uh, we were in uh, Vietnam for that month of August, pretty much by ourselves, and into, into the first part, or two weeks of September. And there was a brigade of the 101st Airborne that, that, that was our sheltering 
organization. They, they provide us uh, security, um, they, they fed us, they, they did everything. They helped us set up a water point so we could go get our little showers and generally trying to teach us how to, how to be safe. And, and, and the reason I say that because some nights, some nights we get a sniper shooting at us and, and then for some reason when they had automatic, every other bullet was, every fifth one was marked, so you could, you could, you could actually look at it. So you get down, and, and they taught us how to, how to react to that. But don't do any shooting. You don't shoot anything. You take care of that, because we might shoot one of them accidentally. Mm -hmm. So we did that, and that was fine. And then we found out what our job is. And one star got up and he gave us this rollicking speech that we're going we're gonna to stop the communists here. They're, they're, they're trying to come to stepping stones across the Pacific and, and eventually get us in our homeland. So we're going to stop them right here uh, in, in this uh, Indo-Chinese area. Okay, fine, General. <laughs> Great. What are we going to do tomorrow? So tomorrow we showed up, and they suggested wear a hat to cover our eyes because it's bright out. We're going to work all day, and uh, so we, we, we had our we had our green little tigs on, whatever you want to call those things, and our leather ja uh, leather shoes, <coughs> uh, boots, and uh, so this big guy, he must outrank the general or something. Well, he was, whatever rank he was, he was he must have been really up there because he showed up and he's from the Corps of Engineers and, and he's going to show us what to do today. And so he explained the layout of the facility and one large area had to be clean, and we were, they should have sent privates, but they sent you all, so you're going to have to learn how to clear the area so you can land 453 helicopters or whatever. So we went out there that day, and we worked our tails off, and he made sure we had water breaks, and he was up there checking our work and make sure we go down and get it right, and, and then we had some Vietnamese go with us. They probably worked with us in the daytime and were Viet Cong at night. I have a picture. I was standing with my Viet Cong buddy. He had one of these. I, I still have my my, my bamboo, uh, whatever, machete. Uh, but um, anyway, he worked us like dogs. I mean, that was a long day. We were all dragging and sweating, and, and we took off our shirts, and the T-shirts were all wet. And so finally, we put our shirts back on. He put his t-shirt shirt on, and we all looked at him, and we, we just about fell over. He was a corporal. <laughs> and he had all of us driving. He drove us nuts. Mm -hmm. And he just, I don't know where he went. We didn't see him again, but he was some probably got, got some other group going. <laughs> he, but he knew what he was doing. Mm -hmm. He knew We didn't know what he was doing. And all of us had calluses. We didn't have any gloves. So we did that, and we did that, and did that, and they had bulldozers and all kinds of stuff. And, and where, where, the, where we had our tents near the airfield, uh, one side of the airfield, the tents, then you had the airfield, then you had some more, uh, you had a, a blank area, then you had the, the river, the Bonson River. So um, we, we had to walk across the airstrip and across this open field to get down to the river. And so this big black guy, I, I assigned everybody a buddy. And I said, you're not my buddy, you're my bodyguard. So we're not buddies. None of this chummy, chummy stuff. He was a he was a neat guy. I forget where he came from, but he, he was a very personable gentleman. Uh, he was a um, he was in a fire team, so he was he was very glib with a, a rifle, very good with a ri rifle. So we uh, we were out there together. So I I walked with him across the field next to the to the uh, mansion. And while he was bathing, I, I had my rifle. I had, I had ammunition, and, and I was ready. So I'd, I'd be looking around my, my little sector, and, and, and the, the defense was way down here. I wasn't going to shoot anybody, but the defense was, you know, that, that, they had to watch the river and watch us. And, but I, I watched for him, and then when I got, got my little bath, while well, he did the same thing, and then when we come back, walk across that area. So we did that for a couple of days. And about the third or fourth day, all of a sudden, the, the, all, the area was cordoned off, and there was bulldozers with these thrashers in front of it. And every time they hit a, a bouncing bed, it would pump up about this high and go off, and it would it would hit an area about 30 meters out. And, and, and had we, had one of those things going off with this gentleman and myself, 
we'd have been dead. Mm -hmm. We walked across that time, and all of us did, for three, two or three days. And they finally figured out, so they, they got them all, they got rid of all that stuff. They, they just kept doing it over, and it, it would rock, rock the machine, and then they'd adjust it, and then they'd go, continue on. So we did that for, for uh, well, well, whatever it took us, and then, and then they finished that up. Then, uh, oh, uh, I was up at night. There's always something to do at night. You have to just, I don't know what it is, but they had something for us to do at night. We had movies at night, and even the, even the Viet Cong watched the movies, and then, then every once in a while they'd shoot at it. <laughs> okay, this tape is now finishing up, so I've got to pause here.